Hi, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to What a Horse. I am here with Mr. Cecil Moses, a former FBI agent who currently owns his own uh, private investigation firm and operates throughout Tennessee, Alabama, I would imagine all over the place. But Cecil, we have got you here today to talk about uh, your working within and around the walking horse industry. So to lay a little groundwork, uh, you were with the FBI for several years. How, how long were you with Th 30 years I was with the FBI, and, and then after uh, I retired, um, I started, I retired on a Friday and started on a Monday as a police chief down in Madison, Alabama. And I did that for a number of years and decided to hang up the badge and started my own uh, investigative uh, uh, consulting business. So it's a combination of investigation and security consulting. Okay, <clears throat> and you were uh, eventually, you were contacted and hired by the USDA in, I believe that was 2015? Uh, I believe that's correct. Um, uh, back up and tell you that there was an incident over in Pentress County involving an allegation against a USDA uh, veterinarian. Uh, it turned out to be a, a false allegation. I was retained by the United States Attorney's Office out of Nashville, the Middle District of Tennessee, um, to look into that and interview some witnesses uh, as they were defending this uh, vet, uh, USDA employee. Um, in fact, I testified in that case in, in, over in Cookville, Tennessee. Uh, shortly thereafter, there was another incident, I believe it was in Smith County, over in, in that area, uh, where uh, another complaint was made against a security person right. of USDA. And USDA had already seen me in this other matter, and they asked if I would uh, look into that second incident on their behalf, not the, not, not the US attorney, he was out. And so I agreed to, so they retained me, and I did look into that. I made some, a number of inquiries, um, reported my results back to the person uh, that had retained me, in the security department of right. the USDA, um, and that's that's when we met. That's yeah, that's when we met, and that's that's where I had my real involvement. I, I knew about at a distance the Tennessee walking horse industry, but I never had been that close up to it until I got involved in those two matters. Uh, and the more I looked into that, the more, of course, I love horses and. So that made it easy enough to do and it made it interesting. Right. Well, um, one, one question I'd like to ask is, during your investigation, did you find the people in the walking horse industry accommodating and, and helpful? I did, I, I did. In fact, um, very cooperative, uh, except for the gentleman who made the initial complaint and all the other, even the witnesses, his witnesses were cooperative. Um, I, I, and I, in fact, I had no no one. I felt everybody was candid. I, the people I interviewed, I felt were truthful, um, and I reported that. Um, and of course, the facts happened to be in favor of the, of the government in that situation. In fact, many people in the industry, um, you know, were as I said, they readily uh, gave me their version of what had happened and what didn't happen. So yes, I was I was impressed with their candor. Well, once I guess I, I'm I'm going to probably back back over things too. But you went to I know you went to some shows with me, and uh, did you when you observed everything? Did did you? What was your feelings on the take of all the armed guards and? the way the inspection process was, what was your take on that? Well, even during the course of my inquiries, a um, number of people over and over, the same theme kept coming up that that these federal um, uh, people, the veterinarians, well, they have a job to do and, and I respect that because uh, I did 30 years enforcing federal laws. So I very much respect their, their mission. But what I discovered was, it was, like, it was just a, I thought it was an unnecessary adversarial re relationship that had been developed over apparently a period of years between the USDA and, 
and the horse industry, particularly the Tennessee walking horse industry. Um, and I, uh, I even had a, a high level official from uh, USDA call me and, and wanted a briefing on this one incident over in Smith County. And, and I tactfully suggested that I think maybe, you know, you folks might ought to work at creating a little better relationship. Uh, jokingly said maybe some folks should go to Dale Carnegie course mm -hmm. on dealing with, you know, with people. But I, was, I wasn't being real critical. I was just stating my observations and my impressions as I had gleaned that in going to the shows and interviewing a number of people. Um, and I said, you seem to be coming in with a bit of a bunker mentality, and that just creates a lot of animosity. And I believe that could be, could be changed uh, with a little bit of mediation. In fact, I offered to stay on, uh, uh, on their retainer and to see if I could mediate some, some of the differences. And the lady that I spoke with very quickly, very tactfully, but very firmly, said no, my, my services were no longer needed and, and would, the contract was terminated. Well, now, would that be the Bernadette Peters or the Bernadette Juarez? Uh, yes, it was Bernadette Juarez who contacted me, I guess from their <clears throat> headquarters in Maryland or Washington, wherever. <clears throat> so I only spoke with her on the phone at length. Um, and again, I, I, I made the comments that I felt that, that perhaps they might want to make efforts to try to have a better relationship that this had developed into a very adversarial uh, kind of relationship and I, I, I didn't see why that needed to be. But I guess what was what was her attitude towards it? it, it well I even mentioned I, I even mentioned the, the number of security people that they were bringing in. I felt frankly it was a bit of overkill uh, from my experience. Um, I, I didn't see where there was any liaison taking place, uh, any effective liaison with, with the law enforcement community when, in those venues where they're having the shows, for example. I, I, I suggested that perhaps they should have a little, you know, reach out and, and try to develop, you know, uh, in advance uh, a good relationship with local law enforcement. So that all of these little rubs that seem to occur uh, you're unnecessary. You could do your mission, you could do your job without having all this, this, I call it a bunker mentality. Right. Well, the, the reason I'm asking is Bernadette Juarez has recently <coughs> been <me>. uh, <coughs> appointed as the acting uh, director. So <coughs> there, there's a lot of concern, especially with those who have, who have had contact with her about her being coming in, she's an attorney, and her being open-minded to the situation that we face. And a lot of it has to do with what you're talking about. It's just, uh, <laughs> I, I don't know whether, and, and I guess, Cecil, I can't talk about what happened 30 years ago, 20 years ago <laughs> with USDA and the with the inspection process. I can only answer now, but it it's been my finding that right now, no matter how good a horse looks, if they want to turn him down, they will. And when complaints are filed, and believe me, we filed a lot, uh, Kevin Shea and Chester Gibson both just more or less turned their back to that. And I guess what I'm asking, did, did, what was the feeling you got that was Bernadette Juarez, did, was she legitimately concerned in your opinion, and, and I know this is a hard question for me to ask, in your opinion was she open to being open-minded about it or was she just looking for something to point her finger at? Well, she didn't, <clears throat> she didn't say enough for me to form an opinion on <clears throat> as to where she stood. She listened to what I had to say politely uh, and then when I suggested that either I, I said it, it could be anyone, it doesn't have to be me, but someone with good people skills, you may want to bring on as a consultant, uh, bring on your staff or whatever, and, and try to create a much better relationship than you all seem to have with this industry. And I said it's a very important industry in the state, 
Tennessee and Kentucky mm -hmm. and others. Um, she listened, but she, at the end, she said, well, thank you, we will no longer need your services. So uh, I could only speculate as to what her attitude might be, but she was polite and tactful, but she frankly, uh, Jerry, she didn't say enough for me to really know where she stands on the issue. Well, I'm just- Except she didn't want my services anymore. Well, I, I know when we, when we had talked before, uh, and you had told me that uh, when, when you told her this, that your services were no longer needed, I, I guess myself, I just took that, well, hmm, that's just the way it is. We, we don't want to, because, and, and the reason I'm saying this, you made a suggestion to me that I contact Kevin Shea and Chester Gibson. I did, yes. <clears throat> to and see if we couldn't come up with a meeting to where there could be some kind of working relationship and, and that was done simply to get it away from the all the different divisions of the walking horse and just put it outside that there's got to be some place that that you can meet and sit down here and come up with a working relationship other than you know what you've got well I, I took your advice I, I emailed them and I asked them if they would come and and then I believe I told you that they never even replied back to the email never never even acknowledged getting it which to me uh, makes me believe they're they're not they're not interested in forming the relationship that you and I talked about and and that concerns me because that's a government division of our government and uh, yeah. that was one of the reasons I was asking you that. Ms. Suarez didn't state explicitly, but I certainly, it's something she said, and I don't remember the context, but I had a distinct impression that that suggestion I had made for the meeting, that she was aware of that, because I, I felt that that's what predicated her call to me, because uh, she, she asked a lot of questions about the two matters I had looked into on behalf of one of the U.S. Attorney on the other on their behalf, uh, and I clearly got the impression that 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 had had played some role in her calling me. She called me twice, as a matter of fact. And I spoke with her, um, and I and I emphasize over and over: it doesn't have to be me. It doesn't have to be my organization. I have a large group of retired FBI agents that I have on call and, and use on. And I use other law enforcement people in my business, sometimes 30 or 40 at a time. It depends on the, the matter. The situation. Uh, the situation. And I said, it can be someone totally separate from, from my organization, but I highly recommend and suggest that you do have someone that would go out there and try to build a better relationship. Now, I know there's some history. I know going back to the 80s uh, when I was in charge of the FBI in Alabama, there were some problems with the with the walking horse industry. We, I know that, uh, but that's a long time ago. And I think the industry has done a lot. They've brought in these uh, self inspectors. Uh, what's the title? Uh, DQPs. Yeah. Designated uh, qualified. Designated person. qualified um, uh, persons. As a matter of fact, I interviewed some of those, and I was very impressed with their professionalism, their commitment, their desire to to do a good job. Uh, one or more had even told me that they would like to have more training and, and had even had money to buy some equipment that they needed to help them do a better job of inspecting. Uh, to, it would help the government, would help the USDA, uh, and USDA flatly turned them down, just, just summarily uh, turned them down. I could not understand why in the world they wouldn't offer that kind of training. In the FBI, we put big emphasis on training our local partners throughout the states and counties and cities. And they just summarily, uh, I'm told, and I, you know, I didn't verify this, but I was told on but several sources that they almost begged USDA for this, this kind of training, and it was not, it was not available to them. Well, we would, uh, I believe the industry was going to purchase some thermographies and uh, even x-ray machines, but the USDA was not willing to train them to do it the way they do it. But now, uh, in, in all honesty, let me, let, I need to explain something. Chester Gibson uh, and the USDA, the inspectors, 
routinely use a thermography camera outside to detect heat. And now they use it outside. They'll use it in the rain. They'll use it in the cold. They'll use it, and we have videos of all of this. But Chester Gibson denied them ever using it outside. So a lot of it, and I guess what I'm getting at is this, a lot of the denial by the USDA is they don't use the equipment the proper way either. So uh, if they trained our people, they'd be training them wrong, in all honesty. Uh, but they, they should have provided training. I would think that they would yeah, jump I, at the chance. I, I spoke with the head of the DQP Association, or whatever their title is, and, uh, a very impressive professional person. And, and he said, J -j just he, he had asked, give us some training. We'd like to use this equipment. We can do our job better. Uh, yeah, and the clear, uh, they clearly do use the tomography. They use that outside. They do it at trailers. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I discovered that during my inquiries. Well, it's not, all you gotta do is follow them around. They, there's a lot of things that, uh, a lot of things the USDA does outside their uh, job description and uh, in their job objective. Their objective is to find and eliminate an abused horse. But it, it's, in all honesty, it seems like when, like this year's celebration, they kept turning down horses, turning down horses, even 700% more than they had all year long. Uh, it got to the point that it's no longer finding the abused horse, it's creating an abused horse. And you can justify, or I can justify saying that by going to the suspension list and going down it because by June of this year, there will only be about 12 people on the suspension list and some of those are people that this industry has caught and banned for life that are also on the USDA's banned for life list. And others have been on for two, three years. The, a lot of problems that we have, Cecil, is a person going on suspension for a scarred horse, but that scarred horse never misses a show. The person that was prosecuted and now serving a suspension because of it, he served two, three, four years. That horse will never miss a show because the next show, there's no scar. I don't understand this, but now you, you've watched the inspection process, you right. see how it goes. Uh, what, what is your put input on that? What's your opinion of the inspection process, the way it goes? Well, you know, I don't, I don't feel I'm, I'm real expert at it. I, I certainly observed it because I wanted to get a feeling. Well, that, that's all for I'm it. asking for, nothing, and, uh, nothing professional, just I, uh, an opinion. In fact, what, again, well, I was impressed by the fact that these DQPs were self-policing, if you will. And, and I saw a good bit of evidence of, of their efforts to self-police and do a good job inspecting. If there was a, as you mentioned, if the horse had been abused or soared, they, they would take action, you know. And, and I thought that was impressive. I'd like to see, personally, uh, the USDA taking note of that and working more to have that more and more of that uh, self-policing, if you will, self-inspection, so that USDA wouldn't need a whole army of, of VMOs out there. Uh, you know, they could oversee it, do a random check, uh, make sure the industry's staying clean, if you will, uh, and don't bring in this whole army of, of security officers that just antagonize folks. Well, that's one thing I wanted to ask you too. Now, you were investigating people and I know you was at horse shows with me and that you even went to different areas and different barns by yourself. I and did. Uh, did you ever, ever feel threatened no. or that someone was going to harm you in any way? I didn't. In fact, I was, <laughs> I was told in this one county where I was going to be interviewing a lot of people that, that I probably should be heavily armed. Uh, I'd, I never took my gun out of my 
my truck. Uh, I never felt threatened. Um, and all the people would greet me and I'd have a good conversation with them. Even, as I said, even the people on the witness list in that one case, um, they were very cooperative. I never, I never felt intimidated or, or threatened in any way. Okay. Uh, one other thing, and this is, this is strictly just, just from my knowledge, do you, you saw our DQP is working. Do you, do you feel like they do a good job? I mean, that was did, that certainly was my impression uh, based on my interviews and my observation. Uh, I felt they were sin very sincere, very dedicated, and very much, uh, if you will, on the side of the horse. I mean, I, I felt if they were found a horse they felt was abused, I, I would really believe that they would take, you know, they would ride the person up. I believe, I, that, I believe you're and, right. And, and in fact, I think I saw that. Well, we, we have some great DQPs. Show is, is a fine HIO, and um, the, I, I, I follow the DQPs. I watch what they do, and, uh, and I trust them. And, and I, I, along with a lot of other people, they, they trust what they do. I know that it's got to the point that, that there's not a whole lot of trust when a USDA inspector inspects because it, it, I guess in, in this, I know you will know about if to, if I told, if I was a police chief, or say you, would you as a police chief ever tell a officer, I want you to go write this guy a ticket. When he comes through here, I want you to give him a ticket. Plain and simple, you give him a ticket. Whether he's speeding or not, give him a ticket. Now as a police officer, would you have ever done that? No. Or Absolutely a police not. chief. No. Well, for a, <clears throat> I guess, a, a over a director. Uh, and by the way, uh, a lot of police chiefs and departments accused of quotas and that sort of thing. I can truthfully say in my 10 years as a police chief, absolutely had no quota. Our, our role was to reduce accidents. We'd write tickets for speeding and what have you, so-called entrapment or speed traps, well, it's not a trap. If you're speeding, you're speeding. <laughs> I mean, it. the officer's job was to catch you. Uh, so, so the answer is no, there's no quotas, and I would never stand for that. And I don't, I don't know if USDA has a quota or not, but uh, well, sometimes I, I was, in one show, I, was, I almost got the impression that, that maybe they did. I don't, I would hope not. Well, I'm only gonna tell you one little tale, and that's, the head DQP that you're talking about received a text message from Rachel Caesar, who was over inspections at the time, telling him that if a certain horse showed up, he was to give him a ticket. Now, in your honest opinion, as a police officer, FBI agent, is that a way to do, is, is that an honest way to do something? I, I don't think that should be done. I mean, that sounds prejudicial. Um, I think the DQP should do what he's supposed to do, make a thorough inspection. Uh, and if he didn't find anything wrong, regardless of who, who or what, no, I don't think a, there should be a citation just because of maybe the person had some past history. I don't know, whatever, what would have prompted that. but. I think that would be incorrect. Well, I, I felt like the agent with the USDA who, uh, who did that was way, way overboard in her authority just to up and say, no, nah, you're gonna give them a ticket, and I mean it. Well, let's prejudge in the situation. Uh, I think if, if I were the DQP, I'd be insulted by that. I believe he was. Well, because would've. he passed the horse. The horse came in, passed. I would have. I show. certainly would have been, um, if I would ever. I can truthfully say, in my 30 years as an FBI agent, I never was given an order that I was uncomfortable with. Uh, but if if I had been given one that I felt was un improper, I simply would have said no. I wouldn't do it. Well, I'm hoping that that a lot of this. I'm hoping our conversation here helps a lot. 
but I'm also hoping that people realize that. Well, you may know, you may or may not know, but I am doing some work for the Professional Show Horse Association as a consultant. Um, maybe I can work it from the other, <laughs> other side. Mm -hmm. I, I offered to do it from the USDA side of things, and they didn't seem to be interested. And so, you know, our company, my business, um, if, I, if somebody approaches me and asks to retain us for our services, whether it be consulting or investigative, uh, and if they're a legitimate client, we, we do that. Well, I believe you, uh, you, you more or less checked out the people that, because I, I, I did contact you and asked you to talk to the professional show horse, I knew, and most people already knew that. But uh, I know that you called me back and, and talked to me about some of the people that you would be working for and you was impressed with their credentials. I was. So I know you I don't am. just go to work for anybody. But That's correct. I, I guess I guess Cecil what what I wish is that somebody would come in here and this is what's got a lot of the walking horse people upset right now is past history with the USDA and remarks made uh, such as what Rachel Caesar did uh, the remark that, that Chester Gibson made to uh, Dr. Jet Desjardins about, uh, I believe his exact words was, These, this industry needs to get used to the injustices just as I did as a young man. That's not an attitude to take. It, it's, that's uh, very prejudiced and it's I guess the walking horse industry is looking for people to come in with an open mind and judge us for what they see and what they observe right now. Yeah, right. Exactly, and I would I would second that. I, I think whatever the past history might have been, uh, hopefully that is history. And uh, that's exactly and, and right. I, and I think the industry has made great strides. At least my uh, limited. Uh, involvement in what I was observed and in, in the interviews I conducted and the number of people I spoke with last year and, and there's a large number um, I think there's been great uh, progress made uh, and I'd like to see USDA recognize that well I've carried you to enough horse shows and, and had you in the inspection area watching everything that was going on so you know what type of inspections our inspectors do you know that if there's a horse out there that if he's out they're going to get him so this this is the last question that i'm going to ask you do you think this industry is capable of policing herself oh i do uh is it based on my experience last year um, and my impression of the dqps I think they're certainly capable, and I think they're not only capable, I think they want to, I think they're willing to. Um, I think they would just like a little better cooperation. Of course they're going to be monitoring, of course the USDA is going to send their VMO over them. Uh, they don't need to check every horse, but you know, on a random basis to make sure the industry stays focused. But, but that, oh yeah, absolutely I think the industry can do you think they need those eleven guards, armed guards? I don't. I, I, I think, I think that's money that the taxpayers could save. I, I think very minimum. Again, a better liaison with local law enforcement um, to keep any someone might get a little emotional. Uh, I think that's way overkill to have a big contingent of security. It, it kind of forms a big question mark out there, and I know you're, you're well, it creates, worried. It, just, it creates uh, animosity. I got that over and over and over in the interviews I conducted that uh, just just seeing them was just aggravated. You know, uh, the poor old guy down in the buckets, you know, the, the trainer or the, maybe be a horse owner, but especially the trainers, um, and, and just the general folks, it, it just, it was a, it's an annoyance to see that. And yeah. I really don't think it was necessary. Well, when you go to a show and you look up and here's grandma, grandpa, mama, dad, three or four kids, and standing right there with them as a armed guard. I mean, it gets, 
kind of, you know, you, you, there, there's a fear factor there. I mean, there yeah. really is a fear factor about what, what, what is happening here. Is it something we're not seeing or is, are these guys just there? And I think, I think that those were sent in there to create a, a sense of fear. In other words, don't y'all say nothing, don't y'all do nothing because these guys are here. I know uh, Channel 5 was escorted out of the arena of the inspection area by armed guards. Well, in, in, in law enforcement, Jerry, and this has been going on now for the last 20 years, big emphasis on what they call community policing. You know, in the old days, he had an officer on the beat and he got to know everybody on his beat. Well, in modern policing, the officers riding around in a car and rarely was having contact with the public. And so now the emphasis is on the officer getting out of his car, getting to know the folks in the community, and it's called community-oriented policing. Well, I think USDA could take, take a cue from that and do a little bit of, of that kind of thing themselves. Uh, uh, the security people, they don't have a security um, personnel per se. They have coordinators but they contract for their security. And these are professional people. Right. Um, but they're mostly military background. They're highly trained to do security, but they're not, you know, they don't come in with the police officer's attitude, you know, to get to know the clients, get to know the people, get to know right. the personnel, and have inter, uh, an interchange with them. Uh, they're very, well, just a different approach, and, and, and I think a little more friendly, uh, reaching out type of approach would go a long way. Oh yeah, I do too. Well, Cecil, I, I appreciate you coming in and talking with us. Well, I been truly do. I'm, I'm hoping that uh, in the future, we'll have many more conversations, and I, I just hope everything works out to where the Walk North can have a, a good year. Uh, and I'm hoping that, that uh, the work you're doing, Propecia, I hope you uh, success. Uh, we'll work hard at it and we hope we can make a difference.